Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with uh, convection heat transfer. Uh, we already covered uh, a chapter on the fundamentals of convection, uh, which was chapter 5. Then chapter 6 we did, uh, no sorry, uh, that was chapter 6 and in chapter 7 we did external forced convection. Today we're going to start with internal forced convection and that will be followed by chapter 9 which is natural convection. Um, Right, so let's continue, let's start then with chapter 8, uh, internal forced convection. And the first question is, what is the difference actually between external and internal forced convection? Well, I think you would say that that's a sort of a silly question, you know, I can imagine. External means on the outside, internal means on the inside. Okay. But if we look at it more carefully, there is actually a very, very important difference. And that difference is that if we have external forced convection, for example, a flat plate, and that is the velocity V, the free stream velocity over the flat plate, then the we know that the boundary layer will start growing. And there are actually two boundary layers. There is, there's a velocity boundary layer and a thermal boundary layer. And let's, in this case, choose that as the velocity boundary layer and that one as the thermal boundary layer. Okay. Now, what can happen with external forced convection is that this boundary layer can actually keep on growing indefinitely. Okay. If the plate is long enough, okay, or the surface is long enough, or something like a big lake, okay, then the boundary layer will keep on growing. Okay. So we will have here indefinite growth. Growth. Or it can be. Okay, an indefinite growth. Well, if we have something like two plates or two objects through which the flow will flow, and that is the free stream velocity, then what we're going to have is that the two boundary layers can't grow indefinitely. Usually they're going to meet somewhere, depending on the length. So the boundary layers can meet in this, in, in this case. So the boundary layers uh, may uh, meet each other. Okay. And that is the big difference between external forced convection and internal forced convection. And a little bit through the, through, the, through the lecture, you're going to understand why this is so important. So this is a very important uh, thing. Right. A little bit of revision in terms of fluid mechanics, which is about the average values of Firstly, velocity and also temperature. Average, average values of velocity and temperature. Okay. Why is that important? It is important because with internal convection into very complex uh, geometries, uh, the velocities is going to vary everywhere and the field is going to be quite large and that is going to make it very difficult for us to with very simple calculations actually quantify what is going to happen. So what we would typically be interested in is the average values and not really the local values. But it is important that we calculate them correctly. So we know that typically if that is flow through a tube and if the flow is laminar, we're going to have a velocity distribution like that. Obviously, my sketch is not very good. It should be a parable, and it should be symmetrical around the symmetry axis. So that is typically how it would look like. And we know that that velocity there is the maximum velocity. 
Okay. But we are not going to use the maximum velocity. We will always be interested in the average. Okay. The average velocity. How do we get the average? Well, by integration. Okay. So we need to do integration. The integration will be different if the geometry is a tube then uh, between two flat plates. And we are not going to do all the mathematical detail, but we can get it from the from the mass flow rate just by saying it is equal to the density multiplied by the average velocity multiplied by the cross-sectional area. Okay, but if you do not have the mass flow rate and maybe you do have the local velocities, then you can also, and I'm skipping a few steps, this in the textbook, then you can go and calculate the average velocity as two times divided by r squared divided, multiplied by the integral from 0 to r, from the velocity u, multiplied by r dr. Okay, so the integration of it, and that would now specifically be for a tube. Okay. Okay. Now with temperature, we have to do something very similar. With temperature, things look a little bit different, but the principle is exactly the same. Okay. So if we look at a temperature field somewhere inside a tube, then it would typically look like something like that. Okay. And temperature is not a vector, but what I'm going to do is these lengths of the lines is an indication of the temperature. Okay. Okay, that's an indication of the temperature. So what we can see in this case is that the wall temperature, Ts, is actually larger than the free stream temperature. And there will be heat transfer from the outside to the inside. Okay. Again, we would be interested in the mean temperature. Okay, the mean temperature anywhere across a certain cross-sectional area. How do we calculate it? Well, we can go and calculate it by looking at the energy transfer to the fluid. Again, I'm not going to do all the details. So it is equal to the mass flow rate multiplied by Cp, multiplied by that temperature. And skipping a few steps, and then you can go and determine that the mean temperature is equal to two times divided by the average velocity multiplied by r squared multiplied by the integral from zero to r, the temperature which is a function of r multiplied by u which is a function of r multiplied by r dr. Okay. So that is actually how we can get the average temperature because this temperature here will always also be being influenced by the specific velocity. Okay. The velocity at any specific point will also have an influence on the mean temperature. Okay. Now, things that you do know, but let's just do a little bit of a revision. In internal forced convection, the Reynolds number is a very important parameter because it gives us an indication of if the flow regime is laminar or turbulent. So it is equal to the density multiplied by the average velocity multiplied by, take note, the diameter. For a smooth tube, normally it would be the diameter. We're going to come back to that just now divided by the viscosity, or it is equal to the average velocity multiplied by the diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity. Okay, now where do we get all these values from? Well, normally what we're going to say is, well, the average velocity is very easy. We're going to determine it from the mass flow rate it's equal to rho multiplied by the area multiplied by the average velocity. Okay. 
and it is equal to rho multiplied by pi divided by 4 multiplied by d squared multiplied by the average velocity. So that is the cross-sectional area of the tube. So we are looking through tube, flow through a tube like that with that the diameter d. Okay. Pi divided by 4, d squared, v average. Okay. Now if we look at this velocity term in there, okay, then you can see that we can actually write the average velocity as the mass flow rate divided by rho pi divided by 4 d squared. Okay. Now let's call this equation 1, equation of Reynolds number. And this is the equation of the average velocity determined from the mass flow rate, the mass flow rate through the tube. Okay. okay, so what you can see is that if we put in the velocity there, we can actually write the Reynolds number as a function of the mass flow rate. Okay. So if you do that, then you'll be able to see you can write the Reynolds number now as 4 times the mass flow rate divided by the viscosity pi divided by the diameter. It is just, it can save you a minute or two in your calculations, in many cases. So it is just a convenient way of writing the Reynolds number as a function of mass flow rate and not as a function of velocity. Okay. So very elementary. So mark that equation. It's a very handy equation to use and uh, a very nice thing. Okay. okay. Now although we've done this calculation now, for a tube, a circular tube, there are many geometries which are not circular. Okay. So for example, as you know, we can have a geometry like that, the one that we've considered just now, or it can be a square duct like that, okay. flow through there, or it can be a rectangular type of duct, something like that. Okay. Or we can even maybe have channel flow. Okay. Channel flow. Okay, so there's the flow. Something like that. Okay. Okay, so in this case, if I can just show it like that, the flow would be filling up the whole cross-sectional area. Okay, all the different cases. Okay, now to accommodate all these different variations, as you know, we make use of the hydraulic diameter. The hydraulic diameter dH. Okay, where the hydraulic diameter dH is defined as four times, take note, the cross-sectional area of the flow divided by P, the perimeter, but it is the wetted perimeter. The wetted perimeter. Okay, because this concept is sometimes a little bit difficult for students, Let's just look at three combinations of this. Let's look at the case where we've got flow through a rectangular duct with dimensions A and B. And the flow fills up the rectangular duct. Okay. It fills it up. So, if we now calculate the hydraulic diameter, it is equal to four, four times <coughs> the cross-sectional area, and the cross-sectional area is equal to A times B, <coughs> you agree, divided by the wetted perimeter. Okay. 
So the weighted perimeter everywhere where it is wet is equal to A plus B plus A plus B. Okay, just go around to the perimeter. Okay. So A plus B plus A plus B. Very, very simple. You agree? Okay. And you can make it a little bit more, you can go and write it a little bit more elegantly, but in principle, that is the hydraulic diameter for a rectangular duct. Right. Now let's look at the next one, which is a duct like that. Okay. Now it is equal to uh, if that distance is equal to A, okay, and that distance is equal to, let's call it Z, and that distance is equal to B. Okay. Now the hydraulic diameter is equal to four times the cross-sectional area of the flow. It's that area there which is equal to Z times B. Okay. Divide it now by the weighted perimeter. And the weighted perimeter would be equal to, if we start here, would be Z. Okay. Plus B plus Z. Okay. And that is the weighted perimeter. You comfortable with it? Okay. And then the last one, so let's, let's just check the definition for a tube. Okay. With diameter D, the hydraulic diameter would be equal to four times the cross-sectional area. The cross-sectional area, obviously the flow in this case would be throughout the tube, it's a full one, pi divided by 4 d squared, okay, divided by the weighted parameter which is equal to pi d and it is fortunately equal to the diameter. Okay, okay. you all comfortable with hydraulic diameter? Okay, right. Now let's get to transition with the flow. Sorry, um, Dextino. Um, wondering why if the perimeter for the channel mm -hmm. wasn't Z plus B plus. Okay, the, the reason the perimeter is everywhere the tube is wet. Okay, so that is, what, that is why it is called the wetted perimeter. <laughs> So where you make the perimeter wet, okay. So it would be Z, where it is wet, it is B, wet, and Z, and not A. Okay? Okay, right. Now let's go to a very important thing, and that is when does the flow changes from laminar to turbulent? We've now defined the Reynolds number. We know how we're going to define it and how we're going to use it. And if the complex, the, the geometry through which the flow flows is complicated, then we can determine the hydraulic diameter. But now we also need the criteria of when the flow changes from laminar flow to turbulent flow. There's a question there at the back. So the, the cross-sectional area for, for that hydraulic diameter, is, is it the cross-section of the water or of the entire of the water. Okay, so that is why I've made it like that. Okay, so that is cross-sectional area of the flow. Okay. Okay. okay uh, the transition. Let's get back to transition. Okay. So, when does transition occur from laminar flow to turbulent flow? Who can tell me? When does transition occur from a laminar flow to turbulent flow? 
Nobody? Yes? Okay, I'm taking a chance here, but it's 5 times 10 to the power of 5. So he says five, 5 multiplied by 10 to the 5. He says he's taking a chance. Any, any, anybody else? <coughs> Sorry? 2,300 to 7,400. Well, that's an interesting answer. Why did you say 2,300 to 7,400? No, it's a very good answer. I just want to know if you... <laughs> If there's a motive behind your answer. Experience. Experience. <laughs> oh, I, I, need some, I need some assistance in my lab. <laughs> you know, so if you've got experience, you need to come and help. <laughs> the what? The salary, is good, oh, the salary is good, the pay is good, then we can talk. Okay. Okay, anybody else? Mm. Uh, to try, want to be nope. <laughs> okay. Well, he, well, his answer is as soon as the flow doesn't want to be laminar anymore, then then that is the transition. Obviously, it's a little bit of a joke, but I mean, there can be a, a lot in it. That there can be a Nobel Prize very close. So I think you you, you really. You, you just need to go and formulate it a little bit better for us, then I'm quite sure you will be nominated. Okay. Yes? So isn't your question incomplete? Is my question not incomplete? Okay, why not? Why? Uh, well, you said when is a flow laminar, when is the transition? Yeah. Doesn't it differ for different dust? Very good answer. That is really the answer that I was looking for. So most people, most people, and that was quite a surprise when you said 5 multiplied by 10 to the 5 is the transition. It's obviously for a flat plate, that is right. But most engineers in industry, or most, yeah, most engineers, if you ask them, when does the flow changes from laminar to turbulent, they would say 2100 or 2300. Uh, it is a part of the truth. It is the truth for a smooth tube. Okay. But not always, not always. It depends on the geometry. So, so you're absolutely right. So if you look at all these different types of geometries that we have, okay, the transition, the transition for all of them, let's call it the critical Reynolds number one and the critical Reynolds number two. Uh, three, etc. Okay, they are uh, not the same. Okay. okay, okay. So, as a general rule of thumb, okay. So, for a tube, it's about two thousand one hundred to two thousand three hundred, but even that is not completely true. <laughs> okay, uh, and I do not want to give you a lecture on transition. But in most fluid mechanics textbooks and in most heat transfer textbooks, that is the transition at Reynolds number. And for simplicity, because it is a, a first course in heat transfer, we are going to do the same. So in this course, 2300 is typically selected as where the flow changes from laminar flow to turbulent flow. Take note for a tube. For the others, it is at other Reynolds numbers, and let's just also put in the flat plate here as a good example, where this one, uh, let's call it number 5, is approximately uh, 5 times 10 to the 5. Okay, something like that. Okay, okay now the thing with transition is it is a very difficult subject to study. Um, where the transition occurs will depend on quite a number of things. It will depend on the surface roughness. It will depend on the type of tube or inlet that is being used uh, and or upstream vibrations and or disturbances. Okay. And I'm going to show you a little bit about that just now. But in general, let's just take a look at the Nusselt number behavior as a function of Reynolds number, just in general. 
This old number is a function of Reynolds number. This is, of course, in heat transfer. This is typically what we want to know. Okay. So if we want to be very, very, have a very, very simple approach, a very simple approach, okay. Very simple. <laughs> okay. Then what we and you're going to see that later on is that in the this is laminar, okay, and that is turbulent. Okay, and the transition occurs at 2,300. Okay, 2,300. And. In the laminar flow regime, there will be two cases, and we were going to get to them a little bit later, and that those are the cases of a constant heat flux or a constant wall temperature. And then the Nusselt numbers would be typically 4.36 for a constant heat flux and 3.76 for a constant wall temperature. Okay. So depending on the heating or cooling case, that would be the Nusselt number. And it's going to be a constant, which is great, and it's simple and easy. Okay. Now, in the turbulent flow regime, we also have another Reynolds number here, which is called 10,000, which is considered in many textbooks as when the flow would be fully turbulent. So there's a difference between turbulent and fully turbulent, which makes it more complicated. Okay. So if it is fully turbulent, then from there on, there will be a linear relationship for the Nusselt number as a function of Reynolds number. Take note on a log scale, not on a linear scale, but on a log scale. Okay. And we will get to that equa those equations a little bit later. And those would be equations which were described by people like Sider and Tate and Glinsky, etc. Okay. Petakov, etc. So we will get to them later. Okay, now if we would take this equation and do that, okay, then that would sort of be the simple approach of the Nusselt number as a function of a Reynolds number. Okay. Okay. The more complicated or real or more correct <laughs> uh, approach is that there will be somewhere where the flow would change from laminar flow to turbulent and that would be where the transition would start at I. Okay. Then there will be another point where it will end. Okay. The end of transition E. Okay. And then there's the value of 10,000, which is there. Okay. Okay. Now, in some cases, this 10,000 might be on that side of this line. So it's a little bit complicated here, but in most cases, it is like that. Okay. Then in the laminar flow regime, we will have that only for certain grass of numbers and we we're going to get to that later and that has to do with with a secondary flow or natural convection inside the tube so this would be for forced only forced convection okay, okay. if there is also secondary flow in it then in the laminar flow regime we might have something like that and where previously this Nusselt number would be typically in the order of 3 to 4, then it can easily increase to 20 or something like that. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to clean the board a little bit on the side. Now, larger than 10,000, again, it's going to have that same type of behavior. Okay. Okay. Then, in this region, region where the transition would start until it would end, 
if you can take very, very careful experiments, like we did in our lab, so by the way, this is a totally smooth tube. If you take a measurement there, there are lots of fluctuations, but the average, if you plot it, is totally smooth. Okay? And then from there, that would now be the end of transition. Okay? We need to also put in the connection which is called the low end of Reynolds number, or low Reynolds number end. Okay, the low Reynolds number end, and that is lower than 10,000 up to the critical point. Okay, okay now what, what influences the flow as it starts changing from laminar flow to turbulent flow? Firstly, as I've said, the type of inlet. So the influences on the critical Reynolds number. The first influence is the type of inlet which is being used. You can have an inlet which typically looks like that, which is called a square edged. A square edged inlet. Okay. The second one is called the re entrant. So that is typically look like that. Okay, the re entrant. Okay. And I've drawn it now that this re entrant is typically about one diameter. Obviously, it can be a half or a quarter or something like that. And this typically happens in manufacturing. If you manufacture uh, heat exchangers, chillers, etc., you've got this tube, you have to connect it to that one, and somehow you need to weld it on the outside or you need to roll it in, but you have to seal it. Okay, so that is the result of the re entrant. And then the other type, which is not being used a lot in industry, is called the bell mouth. Okay, so this type of inlet is specifically being used in very special applications where erosion is a very, very big problem. Okay. Okay. Now all of these different types of inlets, as you can imagine, if this is a uniform velocity distribution, the result of all of them would be that the growth in the boundary layers would be different. Okay. This boundary layer would be very, very thin. Okay. And the result of that is that transition can be almost at 20,000 okay. and not at 2,300. So if the inlet is very, very smooth, like for a bell mouth, and if you come back to this graph, okay, we previously we've said that transition occurs at 2,300. That would not be the case. It will only be at 10,000 or almost 20,000. Okay. So the type of inlet is the first influence on the point where the transition occurs from laminar to turbulent. Okay. The second one would be uh, upstream turbulence levels in the flow. Okay. The upstream turbulence levels in the flow and then thirdly, vibrations. As you know, every bowling has, do have a natural frequency, so it is vibrating a little bit, and that influences the transition point. And then other external types of external forces, for example, if maybe if we are busy there in the lab with these types of experiments and the how train would pass us, then that can also cause the transition point to change, to be different than previously. Oh, and then I forgot one of the most important ones is also surface roughness. Surface roughness and all of that would have an influence on where the transition would occur. Okay. Now we've already looked previously at boundary layers 
We have to look at them again because it is so important in terms of what I'm going to put together now. So let's first again look at the velocity boundary layer. Okay. The velocity boundary layer, and this is, I'm going to try to make very good sketches. I'm not very good with it. But that would be equal to the velocity V going into the tube. Okay. Now we know that if at this point here you would be able to measure the velocities and this is 10 meters per second, then you're also going to measure 10 meters per second there. Okay. You agree? Okay. If you would now go down, then everything would be 10 except at that point there where it would be zero. So the largest velocity gradient is at that point. You agree? Okay. And from that point also the boundary layer will start growing. So that velocity is equal to zero. So the boundary layer thickness is zero. And if you can think of these flows as plates of fluid, where the first plate here now is being stopped, Okay. And once it has been stopped, the plate on top of it would also now start feeling this other one who stopped and it causes a chain reaction. And the result is that the boundary layer will start grow. Okay. And let's draw it like that. Okay. So if the boundary layer grows like that and at this specific point here, we would like to look at what happens in the tube, then in this core region, okay, in the core region, outside the boundary layers, the velocities would be exactly equal to BV. Okay. So that velocity there would all be equal to exactly V inside there. Okay. But here it would decrease to zero. So that would typically be what happens in the boundary layer. Okay. Up to the point where the two boundary layers meet. Okay. And when they meet, if the flow is laminar, we're going to have a velocity like that. Okay. And this velocity here is not going to be the free stream velocity. Okay. It's not going to be the free stream velocity anymore. Okay, so that is going to be the maximum velocity and the average. That velocity V average be equal to that velocity there. Okay. Now in terms of what I've described with the flow, which is 10 meters per second here, and just there, now it is going to be zero. So the gradient there, the velocity gradient, is going to be the highest, okay? And the shear stress is also going to be the highest at that point, okay? Okay, so if we now will draw the friction factor as a function of x. Friction factor as a function of x. Then, that point there is called LH. Okay, LH. That is how long it takes before the flow is fully developed. Okay, that is how long it takes before it is fully developed. Right, so if we would typically plot the friction factor as a function of position, then it would typically do something uh, like that. Oops. No. Okay. So 
So theoretically here, where x is equal to zero, it would be infinite. Okay. Then it would decrease up to this point. And from this point on forwards, fx would be a constant. It would be a constant. Okay. So to distinguish these two flow regimes, okay. Okay, these two flow regimes, we would call them hydrodynamically developing developing flow. Okay, while on this side we will call them hydrodynamically fully developed. Hydrodynamically developing and this one hydrodynamically fully developed. Right. So that is now for the velocities. Let's look at the temperatures. The principle is the same, but there are a few differences. So if that would be the same tube, and now we have the flow, phi v infinite, and that would be equal to, the lengths would typically be equal to the inlet temperature. The inlet temperature. Okay. okay. So what is going to happen at that point there? Okay. This tube is going to be at a temperature Ts, which is not going to be the same than that. Okay. So again, there's going to be a boundary layer developing. Okay. Let me just like to sketch it here for you, where I've got some space. Okay. Okay. So in the core, the temperature would be constant. He doesn't know what is happening near the boundary layer. Okay, that is irritational flow. And that is in fluid mechanics and aerodynamics. That is where the first theories made it possible for us to calculate velocities and pressures. Okay. So the temperature there would be equal to Ti. Same temperature than there. Okay. But now what is a little bit different is that the temperature doesn't do that because let's look at the example of T is higher than that. Okay. The result would be if that is the temperature T S and that is the temperature T S, okay, and the temperature profile would look something like that. Let me draw it in yellow so that you can see it a little bit better. Something like that. You agree? And for the case, if the surface temperature is lower, if the surface temperature is lower, then that would be the temperature in the core. Okay. This is the temperature on the wall there. And the temperature profile would look something like that. Okay. Okay, so if we look at the temperatures, and we would like to calculate the heat transfer rate. Okay. If we do it at this point here, okay, then the temperature difference at this point is the highest. Okay. And then it becomes lower. So if we look at the heat transfer coefficient, okay. Okay, what I should have also done is I should have uh, also put in this, this one how it looks like if it is fully developed and if it's fully developed it looks like that. 
not a good sketch, but in principle you can understand. Okay. So the two boundary layers now meet. There they haven't met yet, but there they meet. That is one of the important characteristics of internal forced convection if you compare it to external forced convection. Okay. So if we now look at the heat transfer coefficient, and it's x, which means it's the local one. Okay. At this point here, it is fully developed. So fully developed means from there on it's going to be a constant. But before that, the behavior is going to be also something like that. So the heat transfer coefficient as a function of the distance x. And again, we are going to have two different regimes here. Okay. Okay, the first one is going to be thermally developing thermally developing flow and this one is going to be thermally fully developed. So now we've got hydrodynamically developing, hydrodynamically fully developed, thermally developing, and thermally fully developed, and then there's another one which is called fully developed. Now when is it fully developed? Okay, fully developed. And it is the best to show it with a few examples. Okay. So let's look at the case where that is the boundary layer thickness for the velocity and that one is for temperature. Okay. Okay, I forgot to mention, okay, in this sketch we've called this distance LH. In this sketch we call that distance LT. So the length, how long it takes to get fully, thermally fully developed. Okay. Right, so let's just look at an example. The first example is LH is 3 okay. and LT is equal to 4. Okay. So it takes 3 meters to be hydrodynamically fully developed and it takes 4 meters to be thermally fully developed. Then it would be fully developed at 4 meters. So the, the one which is the largest is going to determine how long does it take to be fully developed. So fully developed means it's thermally fully developed and hydrodynamically fully developed. You can get the opposite problem where that is the thermal boundary layer and that one is equal to, that one is the hydrodynamic boundary layer. Okay. So that distance is equal to LT and that distance is equal to LH. Okay. Okay. And in this case, let's choose LT equal to 5. Uh, da, 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 da. No, sorry, I've made a mistake. Sorry, that is LT and that is equal to LH. It's the opposite as the previous case. Okay, LT, different. In this case, the flow is thermally fully developed before it is uh, hydrodynamically fully developed. So now we've got LT is equal to 5 and LH is equal to 8. So it would be fully developed at 8 meters. Okay. Okay, then there's the special case. Okay. The special case is when the Prandtl number is equal to 1. 
okay, when the Prandtl number is equal to 1, <laughs> then LT would be equal to LH. Okay. Thermal boundary layer would take the same distance as the velocity boundary layer. Okay. So then it is fully developed at LT or LH, it doesn't matter. Okay. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen? If not, thank you very much, and then we will continue with the next lecture. <laughs>